<laughs> so our final presenter of the day is Michael McGuffey. And uh, we've had Michael. Michael's always been uh, really good to us. We've asked him, I don't know how many years, if you come and do a presentation, and he's always said yes. So we're very appreciative of having him back this year. Um, a little bit about Mike, if you don't know him. Uh, Mike is a senior legal counsel for WorkSafe NB and has been providing legal services there in various capacities, uh, including general counsel, since 1996. Mike practices primarily in corporate law, occupational health and safety law, workers' compensation law, and administrative law. He is also a guest lecturer at both the law and business faculties at UNB. Mike has instructed the Introduction to Occupational Health and Safety Law course at the University of Fredericton since 2011. Apart from membership in the Law Society of New Brunswick, Mike is also a member of the Canadian Bar Association, the Canadian Corporate Council Association, and the American Association of State Compensation Funds. Mike also holds a, holds a designation of Certified In-House Counsel an international certificate certification by the Canadian Corporate Council Association and the Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto. In the past, Mike served with Canadian forces in both regular and reserve capacities and concluded his 11 years as legal officer with the Office of the Judge Advocate General. Mike was born in New Brunswick and he has spent most of his life here. He is grateful for any opportunity to participate in helping workplaces better understand their legal rights and obligations to assist in making our province the safest place to work in Canada. Michael is here to speak on the differences between regulatory and criminal investigations and prosecutions. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
We have civil law cases, which would be uh, you suing me for some sort of civil wrong. Could be a motor vehicle accident, personal injury, something like that. You sue me, uh, and the standard of proof there is a balance of probabilities. So what uh, you would have to sue, or you would have to prove to a judge if you're suing me in a civil court, is 51% of the way there. You've just got over that hurdle that, yep, on a balance of probabilities, I've caused your injury, so therefore I'm going to have to uh, make you whole. So at the far end of the other spect of the spectrum, we've got criminal prosecutions, um, where what the Crown has to prove is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now I'm just going to skip ahead a bit because um, this applies only to criminal cases, so I'll go back to the other slide there in a moment. So when the Crown has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, they've got to prove two elements for an offense, for criminal charges. That first one is, and this is the only Latin element I think I'm using all day, uh, the actus reus. It is the physical act that is going to cause the harm that's, that attracts criminal liability. The second part of it is, and this is different from civil tort, and it's different from strict liability or public welfare offenses, which are what uh, occupational health and safety and environmental cases are. So what the Crown has to prove is the act is done, and the mental element is there. There is an intent. Now, I'm just going to back up or a step forward a bit to say what we're talking about here for criminal charges in, a, in an occupational health and safety environment is not ever going to, to require those two things precisely because they're founded in negligence. So how do you have a mental element to negligence? You, if you sit there and you think, I'm going to be so negligent that I will get somebody injured, well then you're not going to be charged with criminal negligence, you're likely to be charged with assault or something like that, because you've actually turned your mind to it. So what, um, what the criminal code requires, and case law has fine-tuned over the years, is the mental element of a criminal negligence charge is a wanton and reckless disregard for human life. So if you are so far out of the ordinary for what you should be doing to think about the harms you could be doing to other people, that becomes the mental element. Now I'll step back into the actus reus and mens rea for a moment to use an example that I'll, I think will simplify and solidify uh, those two concepts. Let's use an example of a fairly simple assault. I punch you in the nose. So is that a criminal offense? The answer is maybe. Do I have, do we have the actus reus of assault? Did my fist come into contact with your nose? The answer is yes. The problem for the Crown Prosecutor, or the police laying the charges, will be determining the mens rea, or the guilty mind. Pretty easy if before my fist comes into contact with your nose, I say, I can't stand you, I'm going to punch you in the nose. Pretty clearly, we've got the mens rea. But what happens if I'm just flailing about, or at a concert, and I swing my arms, or I yawn, and I accidentally come into contact with your nose? Is that a guilty mind of assault? The answer to that is no. Could it be criminal negligence? Maybe, probably not, because it's not such a marked departure from what we expect as normal behavior to attract criminal negligence. So what we're going to wind up with there is you probably suing me for your broken glasses or your broken nose. But it's not apt to be a criminal offense. I use that example primarily because um, it, it, it's a simple example that kind of solidifies the concept of what the act is and what the mental element is. So let's go back to this slide for a moment. Um, and we've looked at two ends of the spectrum, and I realize I should have put them at the ends of the spectrum. We've got civil actions and criminal prosecutions. Um, and smack dab in the middle, where it should be, I'll fix that if I 
use this presentation again, are at the far end of the right, which is strict liability or public welfare prosecutions. Um, I don't want to bore you with too much history, as I just started to bore you with too much, much history, but um, in my opinion, um, modern occupational health and safety law in Canada starts in 1978. Anything prior to that uh, is still occupational health and safety law, but there was a Supreme Court of Canada case in 1978 which really created the modern health and safety regime that we all know and work in today. The case, which I just realized, I said I've given you all the cases I cite here, I didn't include this one. I don't think you really need to read this one, but if anybody wants it, uh, I can certainly provide you a copy of it. It's called The City of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and the Sault Ste. Marie decision um, is an environmental case, and what it involves is the city of Sault Ste. Marie contracted out its municipal <coughs> garbage collection to a contractor who hauls trash. Uh, and the requirement was they pick up the garbage, they take it to a landfill, and they deposit it there, they get paid, contract satisfied. Now the contractor <coughs> thought, we've got a really good idea how we can actually earn more profit off this contract. Instead of driving it all the way to the landfill, we have this property, which is right by the stream, we'll just dump it there, no one will ever find out. Well, guess what? Somebody found out. Uh, the water is contaminated, and both the city of Sault Ste. Marie and the contractor were charged under the Ontario um, environmental legislation. Now, the important part of the case is the city itself. The contractor really would not have had much of a defense. But the, um, the city, uh, through a series of cases, all working their way through the Ontario court system and all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, um, used the defense that, well, we didn't do it, and we didn't know that the contractor was going to do it. Now, in 1978, that might seem like a valid defense. For us, post Sault Ste. Marie case, we know it isn't a valid defense anymore. So what the court, Supreme Court of Canada did there, now it wasn't a complete wholesale shift in thinking, but it certainly was enough of a push to create a modern idea of occupational health and safety law. They created uh, a new kind of uh, charging re regime for proof that split the difference between <coughs> civil actions, absolute liability cases, and criminal liability cases. Uh, because prior to that, Prior to Sue St. Marie, in a lot of those instances, a Crown Prosecutor would have to prove that the city of Sault Ste. Marie had the actus regus and had the mental element. But the city of Sault Ste. Marie honestly didn't know that the garbage contractor was dumping that waste in a place they should not have been. But what they also didn't do was bother to follow up to find out, is the contract being lived up to? Are, is the waste hauler doing what they're telling us they are doing? They put no checks or balances in that. And what the court said is, um, creating this new regime of strict liability and public welfare prosecutions, that there needs to be, um, there has to be some checks and balances. And those checks and balances we now call today the defense of due diligence or a due diligence program within your workplace. So what the, what the standard of proof is for strict liability offenses now is the Crown has to prove the actus reus. Did the trash get dumped? But they don't have to prove a mens rea. Once they prove the act, they sit down. Now, there is a bit of a difference here because, and I didn't flag this in my slides because they aren't, this isn't part of the law anymore. There used to be a class of offenses called absolute liability. All the Crown had to do was prove the act of race, and you were guilty. There was no defense available to you at all. There were some motor vehicle offenses, some fish and wildlife offenses that, had, that attracted absolute liability. Absolute liability went away in the mid-1980s with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It was understood to be unconstitutional, 
to convict somebody of defense without even giving them the possibility of defending themselves. So in this instance, for public welfare strict liability offenses, you've got the Crown having to prove the act, and then they can sit down. Then it turns over to the defendant, who can stand up in, the, to, in front of the judge and say, yep, I did that act. My employee was not properly trained. My employee didn't have the right PPE. However, <coughs> I did everything within my power. I took all reasonable steps to make sure that that accident wouldn't happen. And that's called the defense of due diligence. I'm sure all of you here are well aware of, of that language. Uh, I'm sure all of you have taken courses in the defense of due diligence. Uh, and I won't, I won't drag into it. I'm not turning this in. I don't want to turn this into a, a, a review of, of different types of uh, OHS charges and public welfare, because we're going to move on, trying to set the stage uh, for uh, us talking about the difference between OHS charges and criminal charges. So let's talk briefly about the history. How did we get to a place in Canada where uh, we can even contemplate realistically charges under the criminal code for criminal negligence uh, uh, for, in, for workplace accidents? I'll point out that prior to the amendments to the criminal code, which uh, came in in 2003, it was theoretically possible that somebody in the workplace could be charged with criminal negligence. It's just that the way the uh, legislation was framed, it was virtually impossible to prove. And part of the problem was that mens rea, that guilty of mind issue. So many of you will still remember this. Uh, 1992, May, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, Plymouth, Nova Scotia, when the West Ray Mine, uh, I recall it was a Saturday morning, the West Ray Mine exploded overnight and trapped and ultimately killed 26 miners. It was a big deal in Canada. Um, out of that, there were charges laid um, for uh, under, the, under the Nova Scotia Occupational Health and Safety Act. There was a lot of blame to go around. Um, everywhere from mine managers and supervisors all the way up into the Minister of Mines office for Nova Scotia. It was even implicated that occupational health and safety inspectors, mine inspectors, were ordered by senior government officials to turn a blind eye to safety issues. And one of the big safety issues at the Western Mine was it was known to be a coal seam that had a lot of methane gas. And ultimately, that's what caused the explosion. Uh, the, the coal that they were mining off-gassed a lot of methane, uh, even with the attempt to you know, curtail sparks and things like that, an explosion occurred, killing all, excuse me, 26 men. <coughs> so, 52 occupational health and safety charges laid, 52 occupational health and safety charges were eventually withdrawn. Uh, mostly evidentiary issues, um, they, they had to go over there. Two mine managers uh, were charged with 26 counts each of, um, of uh, manslaughter under the criminal code. Those charges also didn't stick. Um, two reasons. A primary reason is the Crown prosecutors really made a mess of the case and didn't fully disclose all the evidence they had against the mine managers to those mine managers so they could put on a full answer in defense. That's ultimately, if you look at the history of the case, why those charges were dropped. However, there was also an issue with the fact that proving uh, manslaughter against those 26, uh, sorry, against those two mine managers for the 26 fatalities would have been very difficult. Um, had the disclosure issues not occurred, I'm not confident that we, there would have been convictions on those. So, as you can imagine, 26 men are dead. Uh, 52 Occupational Health and Safety Act infractions were charged and then withdrawn. 26 counts of manslaughter against two separate individuals were laid and withdrawn. People were angry, and that's understandable. The government of the day uh, committed 
to fixing the criminal code so that those loopholes that created difficulty for laying charges for criminal negligence in workplace deaths would be fixed. So that's what they did. Now, of course, it took, it took them 11 years, but government moved slowly. So uh, government did bring in a bill to amend the criminal code. Not necessarily important, but I think you should keep in your mind this wasn't, uh, the bill that came in wasn't necessarily focused on the West Ray disaster. It was focused on corporate criminal liability generally. Prior to this amendment, it was difficult to charge any corporation with a criminal offense. Yes, you could probably get them for offenses under the Business Corporations Act, get them on environmental offenses, etc. But criminal convictions was very difficult. Again, it's that idea of proving the guilty mind. What is the mind of the corporation? How do you prove that the mind of the corporation uh, reflected on a particular offense prior to committing it? So ultimately what, what the bill did, um, and, and that bill's now law, it updated definitions, it codified rules for attributing criminal liability, set out sentencing convictions, allowed for probation orders as well. However, what gets us here today is the tireless work, mostly by the United Steelworkers Association, um, who pushed, because it was their members, 26 of their members were killed in 1992 in West Ray. Uh, they pushed hard for government to include an amendment to the criminal code that would allow um, would make it easier uh, to prove criminal negligence uh, causing bodily harm or criminal negligence causing death against uh, <coughs> employers and supervisors. I won't read the wording, but that's what it is. It slots in the criminal code under uh, obligations to protect life or something similar like that. Now, this is where I think I start to lose a lot of people, or a lot of people start to start a question what these amendments do and why aren't they used more regularly. There's a couple of reasons for that, and we'll, we'll touch on both um, as we go through the presentation. However, let's lay the groundwork for this. Um, again, I don't want to bore you, but the Constitution Act of 1867 sets out a division of powers provincially and federally. Now, OHS law was not contemplated in 1867, but there is a remedy within the Constitution that helps governments uh, with, through the courts, decide who gets jurisdiction over what. So occupational health and safety, since it became a thing, uh, has been provincially regulated, unless, of course, you're a federally regulated company. But in most instances, 95% of the businesses in the province of New Brunswick are going to be regulated under the New Brunswick Occupational Health and Safety Act. So, uh, what, when, when the government brought this bill in, uh, they specifically said, now, this doesn't bind courts or, or governments, but they specifically said, we do not intend by changing the criminal code, that we're going to take powers away from the provinces and territories to lay occupational health and safety charges under their statutes. Not the intention. This was intended to apply to the most egregious, uh, the, 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 the cases where an occupational health and safety charge just wouldn't be sufficient in the mind of the public to go out uh, to, to resolve this issue. And, um, no surprise, even though this bill uh, was, was broadly applied to corporate criminal activity, it became known as the West Ray Amendment, and it's still known that way widely today. Uh, and for no, for no small reason, there are 26 uh, deaths that are attached excuse me, to this amendment. So, let's talk about the practical application what does, now since this has become part of the criminal code in 2003, how does that look for you 
or workplaces generally when there's a workplace accident. Is <coughs> criminal liability something that you really need to turn your mind to? The answer to that may be, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to answer it because there's so many variables to it, but practically speaking, if you have a workplace accident that's serious enough to need uh, an ambulance, you're calling 911. And in just about every community in the province, a 911 call is going to get you more than an ambulance. It's likely to get you uh, fire and police. Particularly where it is an industrial accident, police will almost always attend. Um, you may not recognize this immediately, but there are uh, times where there are serious industrial accidents where our investigators are waiting outside before they're even allowed inside to start conducting an investigation. Why? The police are conducting an investigation. <coughs> but what police are looking for at that initial point is, is there sabotage? Was this a homicide? Was this potentially manslaughter? Uh, something like that. They aren't looking at criminal negligence. They're not diving down into policies and supervisory obligations. They're just looking. There is a deceased individual at this workplace. Was it an industrial accident? Or was he stabbed or shot because, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lover's quarrel or something like that, or a gambling debt? Um, and once they make that determination, they get back in their vehicles, they leave and turn it over to WorkSafe and these investigators. And you met uh, Michelle Sear this morning. Michelle is the manager of that, uh, that small but very effective team. <coughs> Excuse me. So police are going to attend, but then they're going to leave. So practically speaking, how do police then get involved? Because WorkSafe and the Michelle Sears team has no jurisdiction to conduct investigations under the criminal code. They don't have the authority to get the necessary warrants in place. They conduct OHS regulatory investigations. They look quite similar. Thanks, Sheldon. They look quite similar, but their outcome is going to be substantially different. So, uh, also fair to point out, uh, and this is a criticism that uh, organized labor continues to this day to point out, and it's valid. Police agencies across the country have very little experience with the concept of criminal negligence causing bodily harm or death in a workplace accident. They don't. So that's where WorkSafe MD comes in. Continuing on with practical application, uh, when Michelle Sear and his team are conducting an investigation, their minds are always in the background, at the very least, thinking about the possibility of criminal negligence. That's not their primary drive. Their primary drive is to get to the underlying causes of the accident. It's only later when they start to think about uh, possible wrongdoing under either the OHS Act or, in very rare cases, under the criminal code. I'm always involved in those, particularly if they have any questions about criminal negligence, um, I'm brought in, but I'm, I'm involved with all the investigations behind the scenes anyway. So, what happens if Michelle Sear and his team do find evidence that they think indicates criminal negligence? I look at it, we sit down, we go, yep, what do we do? We can't do anything about it. We don't have the jurisdiction. What do we do? We call the police, just like you would do if had evidence of the crime. Um, and while we've only done that in a handful of cases, uh, and it's only been active on the two, been active on all of them, been investigated, but only two led to criminal charges, um, police will review, well, they will conduct their own investigation. Now, this is just a matter of trivia. Uh, however, it's probably important to note the WorkSafe MD investigation doesn't have the same constitutional protections as a police investigation would. Uh, you know, we've all watched American cop shows where you have the right to remain silent, anything you can say in Canada will be used against you. Well, those protections exist in Canada too, with just a few nuanced differences. 
Um, however, the protections for a potential defendant under OHS are less than they are under the criminal code. So, if a government agency such as WorkSafe NB can sit down with a witness, that witness confesses, which is legal, that, that evidence could be used against the individual in an OHS prosecution, can it be used against them in a criminal prosecution? The answer really is no, but what uh, an effective and constitutionally valid way for the government to get around, for the police rather, to get around that, uh, which they did here in, in this case, which we're going to talk about, is to get a warrant to seize WorkSafe NB's file. Now, that sounds heavy handed, and I assure you it isn't because we worked with the police to make sure that they had the constitutional authority to seize the, uh, our investigation file so that they could review it. And then they conduct their own investigation, they interview their own witnesses, all the same witnesses, uh, with the constitutional protections in place. So if we contact police, uh, we're going to sit down with their senior folks, we're going to explain why we think uh, this meets the standard of criminal negligence causing death or bodily harm. Um, police are uh, going to also involve the Crown. By this point, we have the Crown involved as well. Practically speaking, um, I can tell you that in the case we're going to talk about here in two minutes, uh, the Crown, the Fredericton Police, and WorkSafe NB worked together from a very early point because everybody understood that this was likely going to attract criminal negligence charges. So everybody worked together quite well on that. So, what is the accident that we're talking about in Brunswick? Uh, many of you know about this accident, I'm sure, in no small part because it's been in the news quite a bit uh, in 2023, even though the accident occurred in 2018. So in August of 2018, on the north side of Fredericton, the city of Fredericton was uh, constructing an addition to their wastewater treatment they were building, uh, they were expanding it. And as part of the expansion, and I probably should have found actual photos, but, uh, well, I should have I don't know how to work PowerPoint, so I just to put this together. Um, I can barely work a cell phone. It's, a, it's an age thing. <laughs> um, I'll probably get this wrong, and I realize I shouldn't crack jokes because it's being recorded, but a friend of mine um, said something along the lines of the way. We used to laugh at our parents because of the VCR flashed 12. And I don't really feel bad because that was simple. But like programming a phone, I just thought I'm sorry, I can't handle that. Or power. <laughs> In any event, so uh, they were constructing a wastewater treatment expansion. And it included a thing called the digester, which is a large concrete pit uh, diameter, you know, I'm guessing, or more. Um, and down in the center of the pit, there is a separate little pit, um, and there are various piping and stuff to deal with wastewater. And as part of the construction, um, and they were getting into the later stages of it, a water leak test needed to be performed on a pipe that fed into the bottom of this digester. It had been found have water in it, and they didn't know whether it was a groundwater or whether there's water seeping into a crack in the pipe. So, uh, they also needed, in preparation to put this thing into operation, there was some sludge and silt at the very bottom of this confined pit. And a young man named Michael Henderson was directed to go down uh, with the assistance of somebody else who was standing outside the pit. It was fairly confined space, and he would scoop up this silt in a bucket, so we would haul it up with a rope, dump it out. You know, fairly tedious work, but it needed to be done. Um, this leak test, however, needed to be done on a diameter pipe, probably about a 30-inch diameter pipe, that fed also into this pit where Mr. The only Mr. Henderson was working, who was 18 years old. Um, and to properly do this, the supervisor borrowed from the city of Fredericton a plug, an 
inflatable um, rubber plug intended for this purpose. It was. He wasn't using an improper tool. However, the tool said on it, the manual said, do not use this when any personnel are downstream of it. If it deflates slightly, the, the plug could fail. <coughs> However, the supervisor didn't know that. He didn't bother to uh, get the information that he needed to know that that plug uh, could not have somebody working below it. He decides, because the construction schedule needs to be met, uh, he knows Michael Henderson is in that pit. He starts, he puts the plug in. Uh, Henderson would have known the plug was there. I, I don't know that he couldn't know that it was there because he could have seen it go in. However, he's 18 years old. He doesn't know what's going on. He's told to shovel the silt. So the supervisor starts pumping water. Um, it was in the 10, 20, 25,000 liter range in this pipe. 25,000 liters of water <coughs> is going to weigh an awful lot. Uh, Michael Henderson goes to lunch. Uh, Michael Henderson goes back into this hole after lunch. Uh, the supervisor, Mr. King, continues with his leak test. They both knew what was going on. And the pump, pump sorry, the pump, the plug fails at about 1 p.m. Uh, after he, Mr. Henderson had been in after lunch, um, the plug ejected with a massive force, as you can imagine. It has 25,000 liters of water to drain out. The plug pinned the young Mr. Henderson against the side. The pit filled with water, uh, and he drowned. Uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but not only is this a horrific accident to a young worker that shouldn't have happened, but uh, the young Mr. Henderson's brother was on the job site as well, a slightly older brother, and tried to rescue Mr. Henderson. And obviously failed. But, and you know, there was no hope of saving him. So um, we conducted an OHS investigation into this. And fairly early on in the investigation, we started to think there's more to this than a regulatory offense. <coughs> the supervisor. Um, cut so many corners. The employer cut so many corners by, through the actions of their supervisor, that this likely attracts criminal negligence um, charges. So we uh, started having conversations with the Crown prosecutors, um, and we also have had conversations with the police on this, just by matter of trivia. And nothing really turns on this, but it was an awkward case uh, because if you recognize the date, uh, this occurred right around the same time when two Frederick police officers were shot and killed. So oddly, which is unusual, um, when it came to this industrial accident, the police who came on site initially were St. John and Mary Sheep police officers because they were backfilling uh, because of, of what had happened. Nothing turns on that, but it was a wrinkle um, that we had to and we had to deal with. So, uh, as you can imagine, this is the first time in New Brunswick we've laid these kinds of charges. Um, Crown prosecutors had never prosecuted one of these. Police had never investigated one of these. Nobody wanted to mess this up, so it took quite a bit of time. What we did, um, we work safe and be laid OHS charges against the supervisor and against uh, uh, the, the employer. Uh, we had every intention of proceeding with those charges if the criminal charges were not approved. Now, we also recognize that because the criminal charges and the OHS charges uh, were based on the same things, we couldn't get convictions on both of them. Of course, it simply wouldn't allow that, the concept of double jeopardy. You can only be found guilty of one offense once. So ultimately, uh, the Crown did approve those charges. The Frederick Police did lay those criminal charges, and uh, the OHS charges were stayed. Uh, this is another bit of a note. Sorry, I 
for these sidebars, which really aren't necessarily interesting. However, uh, when you hear of charges being stayed, it is almost always a very bad thing. What it means is a police force or regulatory agency has violated somebody's constitutional rights in such a terrible way that the only remedy is to say, we can't charge you anymore because it would be an affront to justice. That's not what happened here. This is a very rare instance of using a section in the Provincial Offenses Procedure Act where you can have an, a, a statutory stay. The judge <coughs> was, the Crown went in and said, we want to stay the OHS charges, which means put them in abeyance. Why did they do that? Well, what happens if everything goes sideways on the criminal charges and we've withdrawn the OHS charges and the limitation period to put them back in place is gone? That means that the supervisor and uh, the, 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 the employer get off scot-free. They don't have to answer to anybody for this. So it was kind of a backup. But when you hear terms, uh, charges were stayed in case X, it usually means that the police, investigators, or prosecutors did something. In this case, that's not the case. It's uh, that we couldn't proceed with both, and we used a very little known and almost never used provision in a provincial statute to do that. Um, so here's where we start to get a little out of whack, because I wrote these slides probably about a month ago. Um, so the supervisor's trial was held. Um, and the verdict was delivered on June 5th. As you probably know from the media, he was found guilty of criminal negligence causing death. I'm going to go into a little more detail on that. Uh, this last bullet, the employer's trial is not yet scheduled. Um, that's true, but there is a, there's a development in the case that I, I will explain because it, it's now public knowledge as of about 10.30 this morning, so I can explain what's going on there. Now, under the criminal code, and knowing that we had these charges laid against the supervisor, though the charges could be laid against the co-worker as well, and the employer, what does the criminal code allow us to do? Contrast this with the Occupational Health and Safety Act, <coughs> which says the maximum fine is $250,000 for any offense. You can also get six months in provincial jail. Nobody in the province has ever been sentenced to any jail time for an occupational health and safety offense. However, under the criminal code, what are the, what are the possibilities? Um, for an employer, there is no upper limit on fine, um, although common law will shape where that fine is going to go. Um, the corporation itself can be put on probation. Um, they can be required to establish policies and form employees. They can be required to do public presentations, um, take other remedial measures, etc. You're not going to be able to put an entire corporation in jail, so you're not going to find uh, potential for prison for a corporate entity. However, for a supervisor or other individual who's found guilty of one of these offenses, the maximum offense for a fatality is life in prison. The maximum penalty for bodily harm um, is 10 years in prison. Um, and uh, in the way, I'll, I'll walk you through some of the case law. There's only three cases in Canada. But um, given the current trend, prison term is almost um, a given for any supervisor or coworker causes uh, death, particularly. As I said, we'll touch on that. So, I realize this is a bit roundabout, but I'm trying to set the stage uh, here. Um, Ontario and Quebec, right out of the gate, start laying a lot of criminal code charges. Um, I personally thought it was a wrong move. Uh, the Parliament of Canada said very specifically they didn't intend that these charges be laid for, and I'm making air quotes, I'm going to do that on the recording, so I'm seeing uh, normal, regular OHS offenses. Uh, I realize there is no normal or regular OHS offense. 
particularly when someone is injured or killed. However, the criminal code amendments were not intended to take over, to supplant, to displace the OHS charges. And what Quebec and Ontario did uh, right out of the gate, in my opinion, and I think it's borne out by the way the case has turned out for them, is they laid, they were a little overzealous on laying charges. And many of those charges were either thrown out or they realized as the case went on they couldn't prove criminal negligence, so they withdrew those charges and then laid charges under the OHS Act. Um, as I pointed out in one of the earlier slides, criminal charges, the standard of proof is much higher. It's uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt and proving the act and proving a wanton and uh, a wanton disregard for human life. Having to prove those things is much more difficult than with an OHS offense. So that, that's one of the reasons why you're going to see fewer criminal charges. What are the statistics? And I apologize, there's a typo here. This is statistics as of current. Um, you can see that there have been 10 successful convictions against three individuals. Um, I'm going to just throw it out, but I think the three individual cases are a lot more interesting to you um, because the same standard of proof is going to be applied. However, it's those three individuals who have either served or potentially could have served prison time. That's an individual who is going to be incarcerated in the federal, provision, uh, sorry, federal prison system. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. There have been four acquittals. Uh, there have been three judicial stays. There have been five withdrawals. Uh, I think that the acquittals and the withdrawals indicate um, Quebec and Ontario particularly coming out of the gate hard and trying to take what are regulatory offenses and turn them into criminal offenses is why we're seeing that. Um, the judicial stays, um, those are the punitive measures that I'm talking about. In, in three of those instances, the courts obviously thought that there was malfeasance on the part of the investigators or the uh, prosecutors and shut those charges down. There is still currently one case active in Nova Scotia. I'll give you a little more detail on that in a two or three slides. What are some of the criticisms of um, charging under the criminal code? And, and I'm not saying that the criticisms are that it's too easy, uh, that, you know, that, um, I don't know, fines are too much. But the criticisms, I guess what I'm saying, are not from our perspective your perspective as employers. It's organized labor uh, who tend to be critical of these charges and the fact that they are underused in their opinion. Now, I accept some of their um, criticisms. Those criticisms being that uh, there are probably not enough police officers in the country who understand the concept of criminal negligence in workplace accidents. There are probably not enough Crown prosecutors who are willing to stick their necks out on those. Um, that is the case. I do perceive it's changing. I can tell you that over the past six or seven years, we as an organization, with Safe and D, with Michelle, Michelle's team, uh, are much more aware of the possibility of criminal negligence in industrial accidents, and it's something that we do turn our minds to with every accident <coughs> investigation. It's not a common occurrence. The standard is just so much different from a regulatory offense that it really does become rather <coughs> apparent as the evidence comes in as to whether it's going to be a potential criminal charge. Um, covered all that. So let's move on, talk a little more detail about what happened in the New Brunswick case. I've told you what got us to the charges. Uh, so this gentleman um, named Jason King uh, was convicted of uh, criminal negligence causing death after a trial that lasted about 11 days in late winter, early spring. Um, 
Justice Thomas Christie presided. Uh, I, I, I'm not spoiling anything by saying that um, after his conviction, Mr. King uh, appealed both sentence and conviction. Uh, but I will say, and I'll talk about what that means now, but um, I will say that Justice Christie, uh, who has served on the bench for decades, uh, is very rarely overturned by the Court of Appeal. Um, and I, I hold, I, I wouldn't begrudge Mr. King for asking for another set of eyes, uh, three Court of Appeal justices to sit on this and view it and make sure everything is above board. This is not a drunk driving charge of which there are 15,000 in Canada every year, whatever number there are. This is the third guy in the country to face these charges and be convicted. It makes sense that he would ask to have that tested at the appeal level. So, um, I'll, I won't read everything here, but there are a few things I do want to point out. And, and I think they're going to have a copy of the slide deck as well. Um, the slide deck, these slides, the next few slides, will give a really good summary, I think, of Justice Christie's decision by using Justice Christie's own quotes. But there are a couple of things I will highlight. Um, he says that, in my view, standard expected of a reasonable site supervisor in a construction site must include, at a minimum, that the supervisor had familiarized themselves with the legislative duties that were binding on them set out in the OHS Act and regulations. Um, what I've highlighted here, um, and in a couple of slides, I think should be adopted in every uh, workplace supervisory manual. You need to make sure at a minimum, and that's what Justice Christie is doing here, what's the minimum standard the minimum standard is that you should know the law. Now he expands on that. Um, he says that a reasonable supervisor um, should familiarize himself with site-specific safety plans, uh, familiarize himself with basic manufacturer's instructions regarding safe use. Um, he said these are basic fundamental elements of what I find to be minimally accepted standards of conduct. So making sure your policies reflect that is going to put you in alignment uh, with what Justice Christie has said here, presuming that Justice Christie's decision is in effect. To meet that would, by its very nature, represent a marked and substantial departure uh, from this acceptable minimum standard. Um, I, I, I remember that there was one particularly kind of gasp moment in the, in the courtroom when um, Mr. King, who's a defendant, is giving evidence. He doesn't have to give evidence. He's not required to, and the judge cannot make a negative inference about that. But his counsel put him on the stand to give evidence. And part of his, his evidence was that he had no idea that this inflatable rubber plug could not be used with personnel downstream of it. And Justice Christie, who probably mid 60s, uh, to say that you know, because his vision may not be the same as it was when he was in his 30s, cuts him off and says, The plug's sitting there. The sticker is big enough that I can read it from sitting here. And, and Mr. King said, I never even noticed that. So he really uh, didn't do himself any favors by some of his testimony. So uh, one of the defenses. Mr. King and his counsel raised, and this is, I think, important for you as an employer to consider. He said, I'm not to blame personally because my employer did nothing to provide me with adequate training. Justice Christie shot that defense down, and for your supervisors and those of you who are supervisors, this is an important note. Uh, Justice Christie quotes a Supreme Court of Canada decision. And he says, short of, and the Supreme Court of Canada decision says this on a negligence case, short of incapacity to appreciate the risk or the incapacity to avoid creating it, personal attributes such as age, experience, and education are not relevant. 
So the fact that he said, I'm not trained, is not going to be a valid defense. Um, Justice Christie goes on to say that he could find no evidence that Mr. King followed in any useful way any of the provisions of the law. Um, he, uh, one, one thing that uh, Mr. King's defense did try to play up was the rescue plan for Mr. Henderson if something went wrong. If you read the decision, you'll see the judge did uh, put a fair bit of thought into the rescue plan, um, but also completely discounted it. Um, our manager of occupational hygiene was called in as a witness to testify as to whether this pit that Mr. Henderson in was a confined space. And it was. I mean, clearly, it meets all the requirements. Mr. King, the defendant here, didn't turn his mind to whether this was a confined space because you, as you know, you need to have a rescue plan for somebody who's in a confined space. The rescue plan here was someone would grab Mr. Henderson's arms and pull him out. Now, nobody took into account the pressure that was squeezing him against the wall. I'm not even sure a standard uh, rescue method in, in, in that instance would have worked, but the fact is, uh, King defendant says he turned his mind to a rescue plan which was just to grab his arms, presuming that Mr. Henderson could even reach over his head at that point, and haul him out that way. The, the court naturally, and I don't think there's any surprise here, gave absolutely no weight to that at all. Absolutely zero. Um, so then the court also says uh, to have failed to adhere to any common sense safety precautions Basic manufacturer's directions for use of the plug or legislative requirements uh, for confined space entry, uh, I find shows a wanton and reckless disregard for Mr. Henderson's safety. That's an important note. I would venture to say that by the very fact that you're part of the Brunswick Construction Safety <coughs> Association means that you work for employers uh, who have and try in good faith to have good safety programs. This was a large employer, um, yet they had a supervisor on the site who testified uh, and was found when, when through the judge's decision <coughs> that he did absolutely nothing. Um, he didn't read the employer's safety manuals that were in the trailer. Um, he didn't brush up <coughs> on what is the safety requirement, what are the safety requirements for plug that I'm using. Uh, there were any number of small steps along the way that would have um, prevented this accident and kept Mr. Henderson alive. Uh, I'm not going to go through and read all these, but I think uh, there's a, I would, I would recommend that you, you do read at least the last six or seven pages of the decision. So what is Mr. Christie's Mr. That's a recorded thing. I'll never show up to Justice Christie. <laughs> Mr. Christie, you make good cookies. Don't you guys remember that? <laughs> anyway, I'd like to say that Mr. Christie makes good legal rulings. Um, so Justice Christie says, based on uh, my findings above, I confirm that Mr. King's actions were a significant contributing cause of Mr. Henderson's death. He then goes on in this paragraph to outline that King, the defendant, did nothing here. Uh, and he concludes to say, all of this shows a marked and substantial departure from the minimum standard and a wanton and reckless disregard for Mr. Henderson's safety. And that's basically the <coughs> conclusion. So, fair to say, uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I suspect most people in this room are aware of this decision. It really was a landmark case, not for just in Brunswick, but nationally. It certainly garnered national attention, um, in no small part because of some of the factors in the case. You've got a young worker, 18 years old, just out of high school. Uh, you've got um, the fact that this is only the third case in Canada like this. You've got supervisors who are sitting up and taking notice because a supervisor uh, is potentially headed off to prison, not just jail, but prison in the federal system. Uh, so that, all those combined, 
to make sure that the, um, uh, you know, the, the um, workplace community across the country is going to take notice. So on September 12th, uh, Mr. King was back in court for sentencing. Now the court heard uh, victim impact statements from 13 people. I have to say uh, those were particularly, that was a particularly emotional day. Um, Mr. Henderson's brother, who tried to save him, uh, his life, I think, as you uh, won't be surprised, has really been upended over this. Uh, and he's certainly struggled with not being able to save his brother. He's had, he has, and admits to, that he's been diagnosed with uh, what's called survivor's guilt. And I can certainly understand that. So the court addressed the facts that it found in trial. Uh, they looked at, the court looked at the victim impact statements. They also considered a pre-sentence report regarding the defendant, which was uh, the court recognized was a positive uh, um, pre-sentence report. However, there's something unusual about this particular defendant. And this is public knowledge. And I'm not saying this out of spite or you know, to gossip. Uh, it, but it was a factor that has to be taken into account. Uh, unlike the two previous individuals who were convicted of criminal negligence causing death, our defendant in New Brunswick had a prior conviction for manslaughter. Uh, back in the year it was? 2006. Uh, this is public knowledge as well, you can go Google it. He and a uh, friend of his um, were attempting to settle a drug debt at a property in Woodstock. Uh, they beat somebody up, threw him off a second floor balcony into a snowbank. They, well, the, they were both charged with second degree homicide. Uh, this defendant was convicted of manslaughter, meaning he certainly had a lesser role, but he had a role to play in that debt. Uh, the, the other person there was convicted of second degree homicide. They both served prison time for that. So, naturally speaking, and this isn't going to be a shock to anybody in the room, prior convictions are going to be something, a, a, um, an aggravating factor that, that the judge is going to take, the, the judge has to take into account. And the judge did do that. Um, the primary case that the court looked at was one called Kaz Nelson. Um, I forget the year, but it was Christmas Eve in Toronto, uh, probably, I'm guessing, probably 12 years ago. I might have the date here somewhere. Uh, Kaz Nelson was 2018. Yes, yeah, so the injury occurred in 2019, well, it was an injury. Uh, in Christmas Eve 2009, uh, there were a group of workers working on some swing staging on a, on a high-rise building in Toronto. Uh, the swing staging collapsed. It had not been properly installed. There was one lifeline to be shared by all the workers. Uh, four individuals died. And uh, one was one or two. One, I think, was on the lifeline and, and didn't fall. So four fatalities and one serious injury. The supervisor, a guy named Kaz Nelson, was convicted of four counts of criminal negligence causing death, and he was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Justice Christie looked at that. That was his guiding case, because there's really not a, a lot of other case law here. There was an earlier case out of Quebec uh, where the individual was um, given what's called a conditional sentence. So he wasn't thrown in prison, he was told, you got a two-year conditional sentence. If you keep your nose clean for two years, that sentence will be off your record. If you get in trouble, we will throw you in prison for uh, your two-year period. Um, so that, that, that case really wasn't much of a precedent here because there wasn't really a case to be made for anything other than incarceration. But I will point out that the did ask for that. So anyway, Kaz Nelson gets three and a half years for four counts, um, but the judge takes into account that he can't apply Kaz Nelson directly because four deaths is not equivalent to one death. I, I know 
that sounds crass, but that's certainly true, and it's the way the law has to look at it. However, Mr. Kaz Nelson in Toronto uh, had zero uh, prior convictions. He had never even had a parking ticket. You know, he was a moral, <coughs> outstanding citizen in every way. So the judge said, the way I'm going to take this into account is Kaz Nelson gets three and a half years for having been negligent and killing four people, but he's got a clean record. Mr. King, uh, his negligence has gotten one person killed, but I have to take into account that earlier manslaughter. He says the sentence, fair sentence, is three years. Um, interestingly, and I really didn't think the judge would give it much consideration, I don't think the judge did, the defense suggested, uh, and by the way, I should say that the Crown uh, did ask for three years, recognizing the difference between Cass and Nelson. The defense, and it seemed to be, a, this was a real moonshot for them, they said, give him uh, house arrest and probation for a period of 12 to 18 months. Now, uh, I don't think, I don't think the court even gave much serious consideration to that, and I, I wouldn't have expected it to do so. So, bottom line is, um, the defendant, Mr. King, is sentenced to three years in prison. Um, now, Mr. King has, uh, within days of that, filed uh, an appeal of both the convictions and the sentence. Um, I have not seen the submission to the court, but I've, what I read in the media uh, is that his primary grounds are that the court should not have let into evidence the statement that Mr. King gave to work safe and be. I don't know the particulars of that argument. Um, however, I do know that there was a constitutionally valid warrant in place to allow the police to seize that uh, statement, uh, the record of that statement. Um, so I'm not sure how that argument's going to play out. And the second argument that they've given is that uh, Justice Christie failed to establish a required um, a standard, standard of proof, a uh, reasonable supervisor, but still held Mr. King um, to that unknown standard. Uh, that one baffles me because if you read Justice Christie's <coughs> decision, I don't see how you reach a conclusion like that. Justice Christie's decision is lengthy and well reasoned, and I don't think uh, that you know if there are flaws, it's not that he didn't um, properly inform himself of the uh, standard he had to apply and uh, improperly uh, apply that. So uh, that last bullet obviously is incorrect. October 4 is when I wrote the slides. Um, Mr. King appealed, or applied to the Court of Appeal for bail while awaiting his appeal, uh, and he was granted that. He's uh, under, under conditions, he's under house arrest, wearing an ankle bracelet. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. He's not uh, you know, a, a convicted uh, murderer or a bike gang or anything like that. Um, this is a negligence charge. He's not apt to be out committing other offenses. So it's no surprise that he was given bail. Uh, that would have been, I think, the de facto outcome uh, anyway. Um, so as I've said multiple times, if Mr. King's conviction is upheld, this is only the third time in Canada where we've got a conviction against an individual. There's the 2010 case um, where Mr. Soraka gets a two-year <coughs> conditional sentence. Uh, the Cas Nelson case, where there's a three and a half year prison term for four fatalities, and then Mr. King uh, here in New Brunswick. Right. Um, Just a question. Yep. If, if the appeal goes through and it's that it's not yet, yes or not in jail, this time in House of Rest, is that called? Is that a two year sentence? Is it used? I don't know the answer to that, boy. The question is, um, if, if Mr. King is on house arrest for, say, six months waiting for his appeal, the appeal is rejected, he's taken back into prison, is that time on house arrest counted? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it is. Uh, 
It may be, though. I, I, Roy, I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah, so that, you know what? I think logically uh, it's possible and maybe even probable that that would be still counting towards the sentence. Um, as I put here, there is a fourth decision due October 29th uh, out of Nova Scotia. A Kent building supply store was under construction. A contractor was installing roofing over the kind of eaves at the doorway. Fall protection was needed but not provided. And uh, the supervisor was charged with criminal negligence causing death. So keep an eye out um, in, in media for that as well. In terms of the appeal, I have no inside knowledge. I've not been given a copy of the appeal record, nor would I be expected to get a copy of that. Uh, knowing the Court of Appeals timelines, I would be, I would guess we'd see the appeal sometime in the first quarter of 2024 uh, with a decision following likely within 30 to, to 45 days. Um, I'd like to say this isn't on the record, but apparently it is. Uh, I don't practice criminal law, but when I read Justice Christie's decision, and yes, maybe I have a bias because I've practiced in OHS law for almost 30 years. Uh, I. I'm not a betting man, but I don't think um, that the appeal will be successful on any of its grounds. But that's not for me to decide. Anybody have any questions? Feedback? Cody, congratulations, by the way, on your award. Thank you. Uh, he says that there's no prison terms for corporations. What about the CEO or the prison terms? The CEO would have to be charged as an individual. So you're not going to charge ABC Corporation and then the, um, the CEO ends up going to prison. The CEO would have to be charged as an individual to, to attract that sentence. Yeah, and getting into the directors uh, and officers of the corporation, even for OHS offenses, is virtually impossible. Um, I, I can't think of any cases across the country, even on regulatory offenses, where we charged officers or directors of a large corporation. The evidence just doesn't get us there. The buck usually stops at maybe the supervisor level, maybe uh, management level, but never further. It's just, we just can't get the evidence. Oh, yes, I will. I, I will do that, but I'll take a couple of questions here first. From the original uh, charge prior to the criminal, the city of Fredericton was charged. Yes. Why was that blocked? Uh, it was a long shot. Yeah. It really was. Uh, certainly, there was no opportunity uh, to consider the city of Fredericton for criminal charges, but even when we took it to the Crown, um, we were pretty sure you know, they would be. It was a 50-50 with, with the city of The evidence, <coughs> the evidence wasn't terribly strong. Um, you mentioned a couple of times, I think, earlier in the presentation about charges um, for the employer, the supervisor, or a co-worker. Um, was that part of this case? And, and I guess in, in what circumstance would a co-worker be charged? Um, co-worker. There were no charges even contemplated against co-workers here. It, it all came down to evidence. Um, we have laid charges in the past for different accidents against employees who were co-workers of somebody who got injured, but it's always the evidence trail that gets us there. So, you know, it's, it's the co-worker who uh, removes a lock from a machine that's locked out, knowing that it's locked out, it's not his or her tag on it, but they say, heck with this, let's get back into production. It would be something like that. Uh, I'll take more questions, but I will I'll, I'll answer uh, Roy's query about what's going on with the employer in this case. Um, this is likely, will likely be in the media tonight or tomorrow. Uh, criminal charges against the employer have been dropped. 
um, that's not as bad as it sounds, and charges, a charge uh, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act it has been laid against them. Uh, based on the findings in Mr. King's conviction, uh, it would have been much more difficult to get a conviction, a criminal conviction, against the employer. I think the, the strength of their defense probably went up quite a bit. Um, and I think it's also fair to say that the employer didn't want to put the family through another trial. So through negotiations between the Crown prosecutors and counsel for the employer, it was agreed that the criminal charges would be withdrawn, new OHS charges were delayed. They would plead guilty to that one charge. They were not taking it to trial. That's part of the deal. And the sentence will be a significant monetary contribution um, to a bursary for safety in the construction industry at New Brunswick Community College. Um, I can tell you that the family is pleased. They, uh, Mrs. Henderson said uh, during the sentencing that she doesn't want her son to be forgotten. And I think you know, she understands that uh, by creating this bursary in her son's name, that's going to go a long way to making sure he isn't forgotten. So um, when Michelle Sear here, you saw this morning when he left here, he went to the courthouse, uh, laid that new charge against the employer, and uh, my understanding is that on Monday morning, uh, the employer walks into court, enters a guilty plea to that. The Crown and the defense have already agreed on the sentence, uh, and it'll be a matter of the judge approving that, and off it goes. So that's where it stands. So who, who would pick the now? No, um, I don't want to get into. It. I don't want to split here, but um, the Crown and Defense came up with this amount. WorkSafe and he wasn't involved. I'm not trying to throw the Crown under the uh, um, under the bus here. It's just it, it was at that point it's a police case. It's not a WorkSafe and me case. Uh, the number is a hundred thousand um, dollars. While there is a maximum fine of $250,000 in New Brunswick, uh, case law hasn't gotten anywhere near that. And I don't think we would have gotten much more than that, even if we had fought it out. And in terms of uh, answering Roy's question about what does the judge have an opportunity to say not good enough, yes. But the judge's hands are largely tied. There's case law out of the Supreme Court which says when the Crown and the defense come in with a negotiated plea and a sentence, unless it is completely out of whack with precedent, the judge has to buy it. And this, this, uh, this sentence, the alternate sentence for the bursary of $100,000 is not completely out of whack. What's the largest fine that's ever been levied? Is it $150,000? Uh, I, it's actually, I think it's 175, but I may be counting the victim surcharge in that. I tend to inflate things. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bias element. Have you any civil liability? Likely not. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, Mr. Henderson was a worker of the employer under the Workers' Compensation Act. It's a registered employer, so there's immunity from suit there. And Mrs. Henderson could have attempted to bring a legal action against the employer, but she'd have to bring the action under what's called the Fatal Accidents Act. And that says, that act says that the survivors can only bring an action that the deceased had that deceased lived, would have had the right to bring. I know that's really, um, I just massacred the English language there, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. That because the young Michael Henderson would not have a cause of action against the, the employer, then even through the Fatal Accidents Act, his mother has, doesn't have that either. Thank you. Thank you. Roy, that credit card. I <laughs>